Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the Lord God said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so looking at my left here, you can again go to the website, go to Cloud Seminary Plus Structural Analysis, and um, you should be able to access that. You could Google that, or you, it would just be under Interpreting the Word. Go to Interpreting the Word, then go into Learn More, and then scroll all the way down to the Structural Analysis portion and click on Learn More. And so this is the page here. And then we're, we're going to be using these, these relationships as we work through the text. So essentially what the plan is for Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is we're going to, you have the questions as we work through the text, we can answer the questions. And I'm just going to, I'm going to look, I'm going to break down all the different relationships here. Then I'll give significance and then we'll look at the overall structure. And we'll also discuss where the gospel is and how to preach it. So that's really the goal for this morning. And we are going to look at one passage of Scripture tonight in the New Testament. So we're, we'll be looking at, at Hebrews 11, 8, and so we'll be considering that as well. So that's really the goal move, moving forward. So let's go ahead. Let's, let's look at the text. If you were able to print this out, great. Um, right now, we're looking at sentence relationships right now. Um, so the first thing that we can highlight here is we have this a word now. And so the now, how is that functioning? And um, we'll come back, we'll come back to that. But but for now, we can say when, when you see this word now, there's a relationship that's, that's, th there's a relationship pointing back to the preceding context. So this is, we could say, we could, we'll come back to this, this is transitional. So this is coming back to the preceding context. And in Genesis 11, we have the the genealogy. So we'll, we'll 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 maybe come back to that. This is transitional, and so this is beginning a a new narrative. Okay, or or a new story. But it's not. It's a new story, but it's not dissimilar from what has preceded. Okay, so maybe what we could say here is this is a a new movement in the story. So we're going to see that there's there's parallel ideas connecting back to Genesis 1 to 11, okay? Two other things, let's let's identify genre. We always want to identify genre and also sub sub genre. So we want to look at the whole of of the genre and then if there's a sub genre, so the whole genre we could say is this is historical narrative this the subgenre if we want to if we want to say this is a narrative section that's fine or we could really continue this as well okay in in other instances you would have like prophetic poetry okay or you'd have prophetic prayer something like that but here it's historical narrative. Genesis is historical narrative. We're taking a serious consideration to the historicity of Genesis. And then this story here is also is also narrative. Um, and so historical narrative you could see is the same. And then we have the we have the actor that is first introduced. This is the Lord. And he is the one that, if you notice, this is the first mention. Let me bring up the let me let me bring up um, the text here. Now the Lord said to Abraham. So the Lord is the actor. This is speech, and he's speaking to Abram. So this is the object person. And notice that the Lord is speaking, and and he's reaching out to. He's reaching out to Abraham. Let's finish looking at the relationships here, and then we're going to come back. Um, so let's look first at verse one, and then we're going to come back and just unpack significance. So let's let's finish uh, 
breaking out verse one. So coming back here, then we have, if, if we come down here, we want to look up this word go. What is this word? If we come down to the actions, we can clearly see that it is a go is a command. So we can put here a command. And then you have this several statements here. You have a several phrases from your country and your kindred and your father's house. Okay. So there's a command to go. And the from your country, your kindred, your father's house, the key word to establish this relationship is this from. So this is, uh, if you're looking at now qualifying of action words, you'd want to come down to the orange. And then you have all these different words to help qualify this. And, and we can look around. Thinking about from, we could say a parallel word to this, we could say away from. And so... If we're saying away from, this has to be separation or movement away from, okay? So this is a separation phrase. He's telling him to leave his country, his kindred, and his father's house. So some people will see, will say, I think Meyer says this. This is three different commands. I go back and forth on this, connected by an and. The Hebrew and can function as an as and. But, nor, or even. And even is this idea of like a clarification. So I am really inclined that obviously these are maybe three different things. I think a better uh, understanding is that these are, these are clarifications that really describe to Abraham to the extent to which he needs to leave his 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 people okay i really think now this is debated so fair enough if you chose just three different commands that's fine but i think these are clarifying adding specificity so he's adding specificity to what he means precisely he's specifying abram leave your country to be specific your kindred even your father's house, meaning to say that he couldn't just leave the area, but he's still committed. There is this, there is this movement away from his country, his kindred, and his father's house. And we'll again, we'll, we'll come back and, un, and and unpack these. And then the last descriptive word is that I will show you. So this is a description here, and so this is. Am I missing a phrase here? Oh, I'm sorry. This is, yeah, this, this is a clear typo here. So this is the separation. And then this is the object. This is the object location. So he's leaving his country. And he's going to a land which God will show him. Now, before you look at any other commentaries or discussions on this, what are some what are some implications that we could think appropriately? Yeah, let's think about before we answer this. So let's think about implications here. Okay, we'll we'll come back to that. But but be thinking about what the implications are for for this. There are several of them. Let, let let's come back here now and let's just unpack significance here. So the first thing I want to say is from our from our past discussions, what's the significance of the name the Lord? It's the covenantal personal name of God. Isn't that isn't that so interesting that each time, each time this is introduced, that name pops up. So this is the even though it has not yet, right? So so in, in Exodus three, it's the first time that he's publicly revealed to to Israel, and yet in in Genesis, he, theologically, it's revealing that this is who, this is who is speaking, right? So this is the covenantal name of the Lord. And what does that signify? There are three things that we should always be identifying here. Number one, authority. So when he, he tells Noah, uh, he tells Moses to go to the people and say, I am has sent you. There is this authority, this one of a kind authority that the Lord possesses. And that's conveyed in his name. 
The second thing is, is power. So you have this idea of raw power, someone, uh, a being that exists apart from everything else, right? And so this imagery here is the, the power in the, the burning bush. The flame is not, is not drawing its power from another. The, the flame is not burning from the bush. It just is, it's, it, it's existing of its own power, incredible power, right? So there's authority and power in this name, and there's also presence. I am has sent you. There is this personal presence that's conveyed. And so... How about like um, a relationship? Is yeah, there, so... Yeah. Is it part of the uh, name, covenantal name of the Lord? Yes, yeah, so relationship is always in this word presence. So, so, so let's be clear. And, and I, Mel, I don't think you were in our previous classes. So whenever God would say, go do something, I am with you. That is the presence of God. And so that, that automatically conveys relationship. So when we're saying presence, we're saying relationship. Excellent question. Really good question. I, I, that's really good. Notice here though, that Abraham is a, Abraham is a recipient of God's grace. Why is Abraham a recipient of God's grace? Why is Abraham a recipient? How can we know this for sure? Firstly, we can say he's a son of Adam, right? So he's a sinner. He's under the Adamic curse, and yet God reaches, the Lord reaches out to him. So right off the bat, we see that God's grace is working in the life of Abraham. Whereas you could I would say it's a bad interpretation, but you could make an argument, oh, Noah was righteous. There's no mention of, of, of Abram being righteous. All that we see here is that he is connected, Terah. That's all that we can, that's all that we see that's connected in the genealogies. Now, we, we do know that um, Abram is a, a son of Terah, and he's a son of, of Shem, Noah going back to going back to Eve, Adam and Eve. And so I would say that there's probably a, a line of faith here for sure. So he probably is believing in the one true God. I'm not denying that. But the accent, the accent is on the fact that God seeks Abraham out. We can't miss that. There's nothing in the in the, the point of not mentioning Abraham's faith prior to this is to accent God's grace. Okay, and we're going to see that. We're going to see that later when we look at later future New Testament revelation. Any comments or questions, or does someone want to add something to this? A certain, so we can also say um, it is the according to the pleasure of his will. Yeah, he chose Abraham, not because he see something good in Abraham. Yes, there's nothing in the context that says there's something good, and in fact, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of sin, right? Between lying, between doubting, between fear, adultery, it's it's the pleasure of God's good will. Excellent. Okay, so let's move on now, and let's look at this here. This is a this is a command here. So we have we have the command. We could summarize this phrase. So we can summarize. Let's just be clear here. So if if I am preaching this, I would summarize this as this sentence here. This is a this is a command. Now let's let's look at let's look here we have three aspects to this command leave your country your kindred your father's house let us look at this word country country kindred father's house what are the what would be the significance what are the, what are the significances here for the separation country specifies what what's another word for country let's look at this word here this word is um if we look at the hebrew it's it's eretz this is land right 
So he's telling Abraham to leave the land or um or country. Okay. So this this signifies stability, right? Familiarity. Right? A land land or country. And then and then we have uh, a kindred. What does this word kindred mean? The, the the word is moladet, the the actual specific conjugation in this context would be molad. This is referring to I interpret this as extended family. Or um more than extended family, because father's house is really extended family. This is like this is like uh, relatives. We talked about relatives last week, relatives or like um, community. Because you have to rem remember back in the day, your, your community was pretty much your extended family. And then the father's house is your, your extended family. So, so God is calling Abraham. So God is calling Abraham to leave his land, right? If you have land, your country, your relatives, your extended family. All of this, how can we how can we encapsulate this? How can we encapsulate this? Land, relatives, extent or land, community, extended family. Let's go with land. So this is really clear. Land, community, extended family. How can what's another word that we can encapsulate? What it, God is calling Abraham to do? Maybe He's asking him to uh, live his his uh, old life. No, for that's a okay. new life. Yeah. So for there's a new this, life. Yeah. This this idea of leaving yeah. the leaving the old life, old way of life. Excellent. What what's another word we could use besides old life? Comfort zone, next level, right? He's leaving everything. What about self-identity? Can we say that? In the Old Testament, or in, in ancient times, uh, self-identity is usually connected with uh, land and your family and where you belong. So if you, if you are detached or if you get separated, your identity will now be questionable. Who are you this time yeah. if you are not connected with, uh, with those people and with the community and your, your life before? And it's hard for us to experience this. I can say I experienced this on a small level when we became missionaries in the Philippines because, because we're in a whole new world, right? Now, it's not the same because we had the commonality in Christ and the church. So I could not truly say I experienced what Abraham experienced because we still experience brothers and sisters that had the same faith. But in many ways here, he is giving up everything, and that includes the religious. The religious. Does everyone see that? So let's, let's think about then implications here. Okay, so let's think about implications. And the reason why I'm doing this is because there is debate. There's huge debate here where people will use this as an example. There's the, the the command to go, and then there's promises for all these blessings. And so people people will say, the Catholic Church will say, others will say, like Abraham earned his salvation. He earned the blessing of the Lord because he was obedient. Okay, so so we have to look at later revelation to see if that's the case. Number one, but number two, I want to push us. We want to really investigate the text because I want uh, to show you that that this interpretation is found in the original after a careful reading, and it's just the sloppy, simplistic, literalistic reading where you, you miss that. And so, of course, the revelation comes in later, and, and I guess what I'm trying to push us on is, in, Paul will say the gospel in one sense was the mystery that was revealed, okay? And so people will say it was never there, it was just, it just came to light later, or Paul reinterpreted it. And, I, and we want to say, no, it was here in, in a spiritual, uh, being led by the Spirit of God and doing a careful analysis, 
we can see what the New Testament was saying in this context, and this interpretation is is correct. Okay, I hope everyone's tracking with with why I'm belaboring the points here. Okay, so the implications here is if Abraham has to leave his entire way of life, his whole self identity, to go to some other land. I'd make one more identification here. Is the land specified here? No. Yes or no? No. So it's an unknown land. It's it's a mystery. So God is the Lord God is coming to Abraham and saying, leave everything that you hold dear, everything, your whole identity of who you are, leave it all behind and go to a land that I that I will reveal to you later. So, number 1, what's the first thing number 1 that na- Abraham has to do if he's going to obey this command. What's the first thing? I heard it. Believe, right? He has to believe that this is that, that this is a real command and there's a, a real blessing. He has to believe in the word of God, right? And let's just re- remind ourselves this is God. This is said, so that's changing this. This is a this is a verb, an action word action type word. If we change it to a noun, this is word. So combining the two equals word of God. So to see just works-based salvation, that that is such a bad reading when you actually get in the text. What's being said here is, number one, Abraham has to believe the word of God. Number two, this has to necessarily include trust, right? So he has to believe it's real. And then he also has to trust God for what? Protection. Guidance. And care. Is everyone tracking there with me? So this is exegesis, okay? This is what it means when the Lord is calling Abram to go somewhere. So he has to believe that the word of God is real. He has to trust. And, and so necessarily these three things will lead to then the act of obedience. He has to obey. And all of this, and all of this bringing in this first, this first point that we brought up here is this is all on the basis of God's, God's grace. Abraham didn't pray to God and say, hey, will you send me to the promised land and I'll obey you, right? I'll trust in you. Nothing like that. Is everyone tracking there with me? All of these truths, right? All of these truths, we need to look at later revelation to see if this is true. But I want to say off the bat that this is this is in the be- this is in the beginning of Abraham. And anyone who tries to talk about Abraham earning his salvation, earning the blessing of God, that is not biblical nor accurate here. Let, let's write this out here for a second. So the question that Japit is a- asking is let me ask let me ask a, a question here. Does the text tell us? So let me ask a follow-up question. How did how did Noah develop his faith? How did he do it, or we just don't know? What is first? What what uh, let's ask this question. What comes first? Faith or obedience? Does the question does does this text a- ask answer that question? What comes first here? Obedience or faith? Does not faith must come first? If you don't believe, you're never going to obey. If you don't trust in the word of God, like if someone comes to me and says, hey, I've got, you know, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a deal that's too good to be true. You give me 10,000 pesos, I'll turn it into 100,000 pesos. I'm not giving the money until I believe it. Right? You have to at some level believe before you give. So 
we can clearly see here that that faith comes before Abraham obeys, before Abraham goes. So the text can answer that question. I would say that how did Abraham develop that faith? I would say the text cannot answer this question. But we do know that faith comes first. So we'd have to go to later revelation to help us explain where that faith comes from. And so, for example, we're going to look at Hebrews 11. I don't want to go there yet. Let, let's come back to this question because we're going to answer your question. We're going to confirm this in the New Testament commentary, okay, on, yes. on this passage, all right? But let's add that question yeah. as well. Let's, let's, where did faith come from? Is faith here? And if, and if this text doesn't answer it, later revelation can. But just because, let's be clear, just because the text does not answer it doesn't mean it isn't a reality. It just, it's beyond, it's beyond the, the scope of the text. Is faith here, is faith here or belief in God? Is Abraham's part in the covenant? We can answer this. There is the command, right? The command here. This is the, we could say this is the, the stipulations. The stipulations and this, this command necessarily includes faith. Faith is driving behind the scenes, the command. Okay. Can we say that? I think we can say that. Verses two to three are then, what are they? There, there are very specific statements. So let's first highlight the, the main action words. So you have will make, will make, will bless, make, will be, will bless, will curse, shall be blessed. Everyone's tracking there with me? So these are all actions okay now are these are these present or future actions actions one three this is a state action 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 and these are all futures actor so this is we'll just actor is 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 then god Okay, let's let's do let's be accurate here. The Lord. So here's again, I will, I will, I, I. Now, um, okay, and then and then the object here is if we can so this is this is the object, this is the person that that's Abram, and then this is the uh the the entity. The, oh, let's let's do the thing. He's gonna make him a great nation. He's going to, to bless him. So again, this is the object. This is Abram. He's going to make his name great. And then there is this purpose, right? The purpose is not for himself. The purpose is so that he would be a blessing. So the purpose of the blessing and making the name great is not, the end goal is not Abram. It's, it's others. It's others focused. Everyone, everyone's there with me. And then down here, I will bless those who bless you. So this is this is offering some form of protection, right? So those that those that bless Abraham, God will bless. And those that dishonor Abraham, God will curse. Those who dishonor you, God will curse. And then there is this fear in you. In Abraham, all the all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, and notice that this is the object. This is the sphere. This is Abraham. So notice here that the that the object is the families. The act is blessing, and the the sphere or the agent. We could even talk about maybe agency here is Abraham. And ultimately, we're going to see this in Christ. But the actor here, does everyone see this? The actor is actually the Lord God. 
the Lord God will bless all. So let's rewrite this here just so that we're really clear here. The Lord will bless all the families of the earth in Abraham, through Abraham, okay? So Abraham is the means by which God blesses, okay? So this really gets to sovereignty, right? Because did God take a risk? Did, did, did God risk it all? Okay, so let's think about what's going on here. All right. Now, I want to make a, a, a clarification here. So let's let's look briefly at our at our category. So let's look at major um, sentences. So we have various clauses here. So let's let's look at these main ideas here. I will make. So this is a future action. The 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 subject is the Lord. What type of sentence type should we add here? What type of sentence type? What what do you think we should choose? We've got action, assertion, benediction, command, declaration, divine declaration, exclamation, entreaty, emotion, knowledge, lamentation. Ooh, we have a promise here. Maybe that's a promise. What do you think? We have promise. Yeah, we have divine declaration. So we could actually combine these two. So even these are these are not comprehensive. So actually we could we could say here. This is a divine promise, just to really be specific. I think someone brought that up in class on Monday. So we've got one, two, three, four. And notice this, and him who dishonors, I will curse. And we talked about this. Watch the video. If you watch the video, because we really go into explanation of why this and can also be translated as but and so really here this is a this is not a promise but a warning this is a warning to those who would not that would not bless abraham so the this this relationship here could be adversative opposing and then of course down here we also have the fifth the fifth promise okay so we've got essentially five promises. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And then those that bless you, I will bless. So those connected to you will also be blessed. And then in you, all the, the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so let's look at the significance here. Let me just take a pause here. If you, so we have five, we have five promises. This this great nation here, this word is goy. Okay, this word is goy. And this word means the translation they use is, is nation, but really it's it's hard to put it's hard to put one word, although nation here really signifies what people say is that there's really uh there's a synonym. That really fits well, and I think this fits best. The synonym that's often used in Hebrew is the the synonym for kingdom. So although nation is used, we should we should think of goy in in the sense of of kingdom. And as soon as we understand that synonym that synonym phrase, and for those who want to who who are maybe on YouTube and, and want to go deeper, I, I found that from uh, Luanida. These are these are synonymous uh, terms. The, the the really the three idea the three major aspects are that of um, a government. So all nations have to have some form of government in order to exist. That also refers to a people, and then it also refers to land. And so within government, within people, you have you have culture. Um, and also with within people, you also have uh, religion, the religious sphere. And so government, government, you have rule and you also have law and land. You have uh, wealth and possessions. So when 
this is the thing. The promise to make a great nation, it, it, it has to be more than just people. It has to be more than just, oh, you're just going to roll. Okay? It has to be a lot more than all of that. So let's come back here. So let's look up great nation. That's the word goy. Um, people are nations. So let's just look this up in, in the dictionary to confirm what I'm talking about. So we can switch this over to the, I'm sorry, I, I apologize, not Luanita, that's for Greek, I apologize. It's the Theological Dictionary for the Old Testament. That's what I was referring to. I apologize for if I was confusing you. Here we go, Goy. Okay, so here's the, the, the etymology. And so this is uh, coming down here. Yeah, so here, goy frequently, here. so here's the big takeaway here. So you want to write this down, or I've already noted this. Goy frequently occurs parallel with other words besides um, am, that's people, of which the most significant is mam laka, which is kingdom. I think when we say great nation, you could just as well write great kingdom and that really that really that really brings massive significance to um uh <laughs> so if we if we understand kingdom where have we heard a kingdom language before anybody from our covenant discussion where have we heard of kingdom language before who was to have a kingdom was this not christ Okay, yeah. So, so let's. So, no, that's really good. So let's. So, so moving forward in time, Christ. Moving backwards in time, is this not Adam? Was not Adam to exercise dominion over over the over all creation? And so here, think about this for a second. Adam was to exercise dominion. He breaks the covenant. He's being judged. All of us receive the curse, and so God's kingdom that was going to be uh, overseen by Adam has been put on pause. We are still commanded to exercise uh, dominion, but we are no longer um, able to represent God because of our sin nature. We are separated from him. And so here there is this promise for a great nation or a kingdom to Abraham. And so we see this as a, 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 the next major step towards Christ, especially since Christ is going to be the son of Abraham. Is everyone tracking there? Does everyone see how significant this is? So we can't see Abraham as separate from Christ, nor can we see Abraham separate from, we should see Abraham in, in connection with if we see these two connected, we should be thinking of a, of a larger structure. And what we've been saying is this this structure is, a, is is the structure of the covenant of grace. Is everyone tracking there with me? So number one, we have a great nation. So let's let's do this here. I'm going to change this. Let's use purple. So we're looking at covenantal language in purple. Sir Tim. Go ahead. Can go ahead. can we also see a uh, uh, already not yet here, in the kingdom establishing the kingdom. The difficulty with already not yet. Yes, in one sense, I want to I want to refrain from using that terminology, um, Mark, because already not yet is with the coming of Christ. Christ has already come, but not yet. The kingdom is already, but not yet. So I don't. We so let's change this. We can say this is necessarily, let's, let's use this word here. We can say that this is necessarily eschatological. Let's use the word eschatological, okay? That means that this is necessarily already having the, the, the end times being um, promised and, 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 and promised and moving towards fulfillment. Okay, I don't want to use already not yet because in a technical sense that refers to the we're caught between two ages with the coming of Christ. 
Okay, so I, I don't want to use that already not yet. Although there is this set, already we're seeing eschatology being promised fulfillment or, or I guess being revealed. Let's let's use that word revealed. Does that make sense, Mark? Yes, sir. Then thank you for that. Okay, excellent. So we what we want to say here is we want to say here this is. This is covenantal, okay? I will make a great nation. That's that's already covenantal language, okay? And then we have here, I will bless you. So this here is this here is straight up. This is a uh, this is blessing. So this this also is covenantal, right? God's going to bless him, okay? So you're going to have a great nation. You will you will be blessed. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And so here, this is um, self-identity and relationship. So the Lord making the name of Abraham great is incredibly powerful. So it's not just the physical blessing. It's not just a kingdom. It's, it's, the, it's the greatness of the person. Okay? But look at this here. This is not inward focused. The purpose for having the name being made great is so that he will be a blessing to others. So there's this necessary means that's going on here. Okay. Abraham is a means to a greater. So let's write this out here. Abraham is a means by which. God blesses, and we're going to bring this in here, blesses all peoples who submit in faith. Okay? Abraham is the means by which God blesses all peoples who submit in faith. And so we see this, we see a, a connection between this phrase and this phrase. Okay? But notice, it's more than just all peoples who submit in faith. There is a prophecy here that all families, all families will be blessed. So does everyone see how this is necessarily ordained by God and will happen? Is everyone tracking there with me? Take a pause. Does everyone see what's going on here? It's not just like, okay, a bunch of families of the earth will be blessed. So this promise or this, this promise slash prophecy is that all families of the earth shall be blessed. Does everyone see that? So this is, let's go to a fulfillment. I, I, I wasn't going to do this, but let's just go briefly to Revelation 5. Revelation 5 says this. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation, and have made them a kingdom of priests to our God. They shall reign on the earth. Looking at this exegetical work, does everyone see how this just points this points to Revelation 5, verses 9 and following. Does everyone see that? Is everyone tracking there with me? This is so Malakas. So looking here, it's not just those families that believe will be blessed. It's that, it's that God has ordained that there's going to be families and tribe and people from every tribe, every tribe language and people and nation. So there's a strong accent here on on God's God's sovereignty and will and plan. Does everyone see that? Let's take a pause. Ask a question. Sir Tim. Yeah. Um the blessing here is is Christ in the new covenant, right? Yes. Christ and salvation. 
for all families. Yes, this here specifically is what we would say is to be clear. Uh, let's let's be clear here. So this here is going to be the proclamation of the gospel. And so this is offering salvation. And so this is going to be done through the, the work of the new covenant, the new administration. But Abraham has Abraham has blessing now. Abraham families have blessing now. And so this also necessarily includes the covenant of grace. If we're speaking about salvation, and this is as it pertains to the Old Testament saints. Okay. So the actual means, the actual sacrifice, it occurs in the new covenant. It's also the, co the sacrifice in the covenant of grace, and it's one salvation. It's a plan of salvation uh, or redemption of mankind. Yes. The, the covenant of the Abrahamic covenant is part of redemption or the redemption process of God to the upcoming covenant, the new covenant. The covenant of grace. Am I correct, sir? Tim? Yes. So to be clear, this is being seen in contrast to the curse of Adam and considering Genesis 3.15. So there is yet to be, even though there's common grace granted, there's been no provision for, for, for eternal blessing upon all families of the earth. Is everyone tracking there with me? There's been no provision yet. God is allowing people to live in the common grace but he hasn't yet provided the sacrifice to allow them to escape future judgment. Okay. And even here, those that, um, those that bless Abraham receive God's blessing. Do you see that? So you have, and those that don't receive God's cursing and judgment. So even though there's a lot to go here and a lot of this is temporal, there are aspects here that we, if we read in Genesis, there are aspects here that are both temporal. We'll look at this next week. There are aspects here that are temporal and eternal. Revelation 5, 9 and following is eternal. Okay, let's go, let's go to, let's go to, um, uh, let's go to let's go to to, to Hebrews Hebrews uh, eleven eight now. Okay, so everyone can see this on the on the, on the left of my screen. By faith Abraham obeyed. So our decision up here. Come on. By faith Abraham obeyed. So literally, the author of Hebrews says, "By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place." that he was to receive as an inheritance. Oh my goodness. So look at the new revelation <clears throat> that clarified. So according to, to Hebrews 11.8, number one, Abraham acted by faith. The going was obedience. He did not know. And number four, the land, the land, and then the promises, right? So the land, the promises, we can summarize this as inheritance. Does everyone see that? So he's going to receive an inheritance. Okay. And so this, this speaks to testament that we discussed in the confession. So fundamentally, if we're going to say inheritance here, so let so let's let's take a pause here and come back here okay so there is a relationship here between this and this right this is the this is the act this is the promise right and so someone would say this is works based right if he obeys he's going to receive he's going to receive the the blessing right so here we would say this is works or this is merit that's how some people would say, if he obeys, he's going to receive the promise. But coming over to here, look at this. He was to receive an inheritance. Do you earn inheritances? When, when you receive an inheritance, is an inheritance earned or given? You have a giver in inheritance. You have a beneficiary. 
and you have the the inheritance. This is the this is the the heir, right? This is all given. There is no earning. You do not earn an inheritance. Okay? So the way that the author of Hebrews describes this this act here is one of inheritance. So although there is an act promise or an act, we could say here an act result, you could not say that this is this was earned. You could not say that this was merit. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? Our interpretation, we could not say that this is that this is earned. This is straight up an inheritance or given, okay? Now let's finish here. We're going to end on this point. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So this is truly by faith, talaga. The other aspect here is there is, there is, there is a complete, he went out not knowing where he was going. This is, this is complete childlike faith. He doesn't know, and he's trusting in the promises of God and believing that it's going to happen. Okay, this is so malakas, and so we, so then, so then the question that that Japet asks is, is how did Abraham develop faith? And we can go to various passages. The text in in Genesis twelve doesn't really answer that. If we continue the context of Hebrews eleven to Hebrews twelve. Look at this here. So this is this is continuing the Hall of Faith, chapter 11 and chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, here we go. If you want to know where how faith is developed, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Founder, if we look at look at the, the 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 Greek below, the beginning, the origin. So if we say, how did Abraham develop faith? The, the founder is Christ, or the originator. It's the work of Christ in the life of Abraham. It's the work of the Lord in the life of Abraham. It's the work of the Spirit and the Perfector. So not only does Jesus begin the faith. He is the one perfecting the faith. And if you're going to say that this does not apply to Abraham, Jesus was in the New Testament, we will conclude on this. Galatians chapter 3, I apologize. Know that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham, Galatians 3, 7, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then it is those who are of faith, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And so I want to stress this here. We've just looked at Revelation 5.11. We've looked at Hebrews 12.3, Hebrews 11.8. And now we're looking at uh, Galatians uh, 3, verse 6. And all of these are um, uh, New Testament commentary on the Abrahamic covenant. And so we can say in conclusion that, that it was Christ through his spirit that was developing faith in Abraham. There was no risk. This would be the craziest risk that God would take. If he just calls out a man and he's not working behind the scenes, Abraham would have been sovereign, right? God would have been completely dependent on Abraham. If Abraham isn't faithful, then the promises, then, then God's plan can't go forward unless God is sovereignly working the founder and perfecter of Abraham's faith and then bringing about his plan. So I really hope we're going to continue. This is not all that there is to say. There is so much more. But I want to say in conclusion... The promise of the gospel here in this passage is that in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that blessing is none other than the promise 
to Adam and Eve to undo the curse of, of sin and death, for God to send Christ, uh, Jesus, his, his son, to earth, to be born of a woman, to live the life we could not live, and to die on a cross, and then to, to grant that righteousness on our behalf, and also to pay the guilt and, 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 and to make the penalty, to take the penalty of our sin. And so this is the gospel. We're going to close. We're going to close. I, I do want to say, if you were to preach this passage, okay, you have here a command and then a series of, of progressions here. So if I was to preach this as a sermon, I would, I would probably preach the command, number one, and then the promises, number two. So this is the command, and then this is the promises. And the big idea is the commissioning, the commissioning of, of Abraham. So that's probably how I would preach this. And then you have the specific details. And then I would bring in this commentary. I would bring in Revelation 5.9. I would bring in, I would bring in Revelation. I would bring in Hebrews. I'd bring in Galatians. And I'd also bring in uh, Hebrews 12. This is so fundamental because this inheritance, the, 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 the blessing of Abraham is given to all of us by faith. And so let's go ahead and let's, let's, let's close in, in prayer.